So good afternoon, everybody. So first of all, for those who are wondering, um, I'm going to chair the session today because Anton is not feeling well. So he didn't want to attend in person. He is online though. Um, yeah. Uh, so our first talk today, uh, oh no, first of all, the, a few um, organizational things. Um, as usual, um, there is the chat in Zoom, but there is also uh, the Slack channel. And if you have any questions, we'd prefer if you post them in the Slack channel. We will be monitoring the, the, the chat as well, uh, but for like bigger discussions, it would be nice to have in the Slack channel already. Otherwise we would need to copy all of the content over. Um, to, to all of the speakers, uh, kind of reminder to please keep within the time. So it's 10 minutes of talking, three minutes of question and discussions, and then two minutes for switching and this buffer. Um, we will be quite strict on the time, uh, or at least I, <laughs> I'm making sure. Um, so for our first talk, uh, we have Ivan Liberas from the French Biodiversity Data Hub. Um, we have a video here, or Ivan, are you going to it's better. Oh, he, he wrote there. Yeah. He is online, so he is able to answer questions. But um, yeah, we are Hi. playing the video now. Hi, everyone. I'm Yvon yeah. Lebras on French Museum of Natural History and PNDB uh, Biodiversity Data Hub. And I will speak about the French Biodiversity Data Hub. And then the fact that we can link local to global biodiversity through international initiatives and open science cloud. I am associated with Colin Royo, Julien Sananicon, Elie Arnaud, and Olivier Norvez from PNDB as well, and Ali Sensa, Sylvain Morin, Sophie Pamerlon, and Anne Sophie Archambault from the French JBIF Node. So PNDB is a virtual research infrastructure in eco-informatics for and by biodiversity communities. It, is, it was created in 2018 by the French Ministry of Higher Education and, and Research in France uh, as a French biodiversity data hub, Pôle National des Données de Biodiversité, so PNDB. The goal is to propose an integrative and integrated research infrastructure in the biodiversity information systems landscape. We have the scientific and technical support from the National Museum of Natural History through Patrinat Unit from OFB, CNRS, and National Museum of Natural History. Here, the goal is notably to develop links between the PNDB with oriented to French research communities, with the SIB, who is uh, an information system of biodiversity but devoted to, to, to policy and public policy in France, and JBIF, and notably the, the, the French JBIF node, who makes the link with international initiative uh, related to JBIF. We have 19 partners who represent the bi research communities. And since this year, we, we are a thematic reference center for data and biodiversity in France. We represent uh, uh, something of interest for research communities. Through PNDB, we are using open standards and tools to enhance fairness of biodiversity, data, and software. So we are focusing on producing and reusing rich metadata. And as metadata is really at the core of fair principle, it's quite normal to focus to, to this uh, particular uh, space and try to, to create detailed metadata. Here we see that in biodiversity, we, 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 we have a variety of objects to link together. And once again, Metadata and metadata language is, is a way to, to give a technical manner, to give information about this variety of objects, and in the meantime, to be, to be used by, by people, by researchers, by humans, but also by machine. And in the meantime, we see that there is a, a lot, a, a lot of information, a loss of information, sorry, with time as 
we can see on this figure from Mishner and Al, describing the fact that you you lose information related to to, to research data, notably due to accident or from normal life of a research career, something like that. And and we see, for example, that's yeah, that the death of the investigator of the research project is 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 a moment uh, a moment where we we lose uh, the, the final information. So metadata is a key to share biodiversity information. And here we are focusing on uh, the, the, the fact that we want to standardize data by metadata to allow fine description and also propose tools for inference, identification, and interoperability of data. And to create links between object, research object, can be data, software, and also people, projects, objects, research teams. So here we are building uh, software and services around this amazing ecological metadata language, EML uh, standards, and working with Data One uh, network and, and NCES notably. This, this standard of this EML standards allow us to give information in heterogeneous data. And, and data can concern specimens or backcoding or remote sensing, etc. But the, the, this kind of standards allow us also to describe the origin of the data, the projects uh, funded, for example but also the methodologies, the uh, protocols who can be used to generate the data. And final, finally, there is a work to, to, to make links to us all the standards like ISO or, or, or data standards like Darwin, et cetera. The idea is go to a, a better fairness of ecological data through this metadata uh, detailed description and creating links to uh, the existing metadata standards and also uh, data standards. On the data metadata point of view, you can see, for example, we can use data catalogs allowing the, the search by fine metadata. And when I say a detail of fine metadata, it's, for example, we have the possibility to search by attribute names on this catalog. We can generate also portals, who are something like a, a view of, of a part of the data of the catalogs. And this can be interesting for research project or, or, or labs, for example, who wants to, to give access to their, to their own data. With a dedicated uh, editorial, editorial content. When you go on the, on the data page, on the data package page, we can have, thanks to EML, direct semantic information linking, for example, attribute names to terminological resources terms, uh, ontology or thesaurus, for example. For each data package, we can look at the fair metrics through metadata assessment report and propose amelioration of the description of the data, for example, to enhance this fair uh, score. Finally, we can help scientists generate highly detailed EML metadata, contributing to OML assembly line R package and proposing a, a graphical user interface developed through R shiny called MetaShark. On the data analysis point of view, we are focusing on this Galaxy platform behind the coordination of the Galaxy Ecology Initiative. Here, we, we propose killer workflows to explore biodiversity data, for example, or to handle GIS or NetCDF uh, files, or create biodiversity indicators through EBV workflows. Behind these tools, we are promoting best practices and guidelines to help create shareable analytical bricks and developing also training material 
following up on three good practices. Finally, users, colleagues can can give access to HPC and source code without having to have programming skills and also provide a, a gateway to to interaction uh, interactive tools like Jupyter Notebooks, for example, or Air Studio, or iShiny Hubs or, or others. So the PNDB is involved in, in several international initiatives. First, by the, the link with, with the French, not of the JB, as we are uh, located in the same team. In, uh, we, are, we are involved in joint projects through National Gaia Data uh, Project, for example, or Open Metadata Paper, uh, Open Science Oriented Project, and international projects like BioDiverse, Go Fair Implementation Network dedicated to, to biodiversity communities. We are also representing the, the, the French Biodiversity Observation Network in collaboration with the Public Policy Information System on Biodiversity for Geobon. And here we, we propose a, an EBV operationalization pilot uh, based on, on the use of the Galaxy Ecology Platform and the the use of, of metadata, detailed metadata like, like EML to share uh, any kind of, of data from raw to, to process data sets. And we are just uh, proposing a case study for the global open science cloud called EBV OSC with colleagues from Geobon and IPs. Uh, around this essential biodiversity variables, uh, open science cloud um, operationalization. We are also the French node uh, for data one with this, this network around observation uh, data for environment. And we can reuse tools and standards from data one for data catalog or the standards like EML. And uh, we can access uh, PNDB data from uh, the International Data One catalog. Thank you very much. And don't hesitate to come back to us for any question. I just saw we have two questions already uh, in the Slack channel. Um, Maybe start with those, and those in the room uh, can uh, think if they have some more. Uh, from Anton Günsch um, at the BGBM Berlin, uh, does the uh, PNDB focus on biodiversity in France, or is it a platform supporting biodiversity researchers in France? Is there permanent funding? Um, Yvonne, can yeah. you? Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, and sorry for my uh, really approximate uh, Franglish, horrible uh, Franglish, uh, particularly difficult after after lunch. Sorry for that. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so PNDB is a, a French infrastructure for all the researchers uh, based in France, so they can have uh, they can work on project uh, involving uh, producing data in Africa on uh, other part of the world. And this is uh, the data uh, need to be uh, on the. PNDB, if it uh, uh, gives a, a good answer to, to the question, to the first question. And the second, so, so for the sustainability. So we, we have funding from the, the French Ministry of, uh, of Research, uh, notably, and, uh, and uh, uh, we are uh, we are an infrastructure with uh, with 18 partners who are uh, mainly the research institute involving uh, biodiversity data in France, but also universities who are paying uh, for the, the infrastructure. So we have a, uh, a roadmap where we know that uh, at least for 10 years we we are sustainable. Thank you. And, um... With a uh, look on the time, I'd say that there's one more question uh, from Sharif Islam in, in the um, Slack channel. Um, so maybe you can answer this there. And uh, yeah, we are going to hear now uh, go on with um, Winston Smith from Disco UK. Thank you.
down, I think. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Vince Smith. I'm from the Natural History Museum, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Disco UK, which is our effort to bring together the UK collections community under the umbrella of the wider Disco programme, and particularly kind of the work that's going on in Disco Europe. I think we're at a different end of the spectrum to the sort of French data infrastructure that we just saw. That's much more about data integration and fair data. We're much more at the networking and mobilization stage. Um, and also, I want to thank our conveners, particularly Anton, who isn't here, um, for inviting me to talk to you today. So cast your mind back a few years ago, back to about 2018, we were kind of at the stage where really the UK collections community was surprisingly fragmented. We weren't really very tightly integrated. There are a lot of really quite significant UK collections but not much in the way of coordination amongst them. And this contrasts quite significantly to say groups like the observer networks in the UK, recording biodiversity under the auspices of things like the National Biodiversity Network, that you'll hear a little bit about later on, who are actually much more tightly integrated. In contrast, we, I think, were a lot more fragmented. And there was this shared ambition across this very diverse group of institutions to do more together, but not really much in the way of catalysis to kind of make that happen. And with a little bit of encouragement from one of our funders, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, we were very lucky to get some money to start convening and really thinking about what it would mean to start operating as a much more integrated infrastructure. And so from those initial meetings was born essentially a plan there was very much alignment on our digital mission. So thinking about digitization of our collections, how we exploit the data that we generate in very diverse ways. So then those institutions are very different. Some of them, for example, are very science focused. Some of them really don't even understand the scientific potential of their collections. And others were much more focused on things like education and citizen science. And they're enormously diverse in scale from institutions that are maybe even only open on a Wednesday afternoon on a volunteer basis through to the big national institutions in Scotland, in Wales, in England and, and Northern Ireland too. So we got some initial money focusing on those digital issues. And from that was really born something that we're calling Disco UK, the distributed system of scientific collections for the UK. And this is, as I say, really a partnership between those institutions, but it's also very much making the business case as to why we should be working together in a much more integrated way. And then from that, we've started to develop a plan about how we're going to do that. The first step in that journey was very much to evidence the, re the need to work together. And I was quite shocked when we started this about how little data we truly had about the breadth of UK collections. And so we started off with um, a, a couple of surveys, really scoping surveys, one very much looking at the breadth and the depth of UK collections, and the other one really looking at the digital readiness how digitally capable are those diverse organizations within the UK. Focusing on the um, first one uh, about UK collections, we had 83 respondents to that and were able to tot up about 137 million specimens. I think we sort of finger in the air estimate, there's probably something in the region of about 150 million specimens out there in the UK. So we actually did a pretty good job, I think, of trying to round up the majority. Interestingly, many of those specimens do have some form of digital record, but thinking back to Elspeth's work and the standards work on MIDS, it's often a very low standard of, of digital record. So there's a huge amount of work to do to not only get those up to uh, a research standard, but also to mobilize the rest of the content. Looking at digital readiness, that's probably even further behind. So many of them are have some form of digitization program, but it's enormously fragmented and really quite small scale. Um, and actually, I forgot to mention that dashboard that we generated off the back of that digital collection survey. Do check that out. I think for anyone trying to pull together this kind of, if you like, national story about capacity that you have within the UK collections, that dashboard is well worth a look. 
Um, so we generated a whole bunch of outputs from the kind of initial um, program of work. Probably the most significant is this thing here, the, what we call the blueprint for UK collections. And I've got a few copies of this, but this is part promotion as to why we should work together and part plan as well. And really, um, uh, it goes into kind of quite a lot of depth, really about explaining why we need to work together. So there's lots of articulation in here about the benefits of natural science collections. And I know others who've looked at this have found this quite useful in terms of trying to represent um, their own collections. Um, a key part of this also was looking at the economic case for digitization. What is the financial or economic value that we're going to unlock by digitizing our collections? And as part of this, we worked with an economic consultant, a group called Frontier and e Economics, and they have this model, this actually it's fairly standardized process called a theory of change, whereby you pick various sectors. So in our case, things like biodiversity conservation, medicines, discovery, agriculture. And you say, OK, if you're generating all this data, what is the economic potential that you'd unlock by doing that digitization? And very crudely, just for the NHM's collections in London, we estimated that that value would probably be something around 2.2 2, uh, 2 .2 billion in benefits. And that's just from our collection alone. So that's not looking at the totality of the UK. And that's only in those sectors. But that little postcard visualization that you see there, certainly in the context of the UK government, has been enormously powerful in trying to make that financial case for unlocking further digitization. In practical terms, uh, we've been thinking about how we organize ourselves. Um, and we have this sort of hub and spoke model, three tiers, a central coordinating hub, a regional center of excellence, which is helping to mobilize many of the smaller collections within that region. And we also have a number of areas of thematic expertise in the UK. So things like um, the British Geological Society, who have enormous geological collections and lots of thematic um, uh, capabilities there too. A key part of this is how we bring the data together. How do we mobilize all of that content? And to cut a long story short, we looked at a whole set of different um, options for data portal technologies. And um, with some fantastic support from GBIF, we've settled on, at least for our life science collections, bringing that data together under the auspices of the GBIF hosted portal solution. And for those of you thinking about what portals you might use in this context nationally, I encourage you to look at that. It's been a fantastic exercise. And we're literally within two weeks, we went from basically a paper-based concept to a fully working prototype. So um, uh, uh, that's been enormously uh, valuable and that portal will be launching soon. Now, Life science collections don't total the totality of our problem. We've also got a huge issue within our community and how we do this robustly for earth science collections too. And there, I think there's a lot more work to do in terms of thinking about what it is that that earth science community wants from their data and how we can best represent that. And we've taken the approach there of employing a business analyst to basically get a lot more data about what it is that we want to achieve with that uh, aggregation of earth science data. So um, a lot more thinking about. Another emerging need is 3D data. And again, to cut a long story short, I think we're going to, uh, we're increasingly converging on using something like MorphoSource um, and creating a UK and national node for Morph MorphoSource to try and share many of our 3D data sets. NHM alone has literally tens of thousands of these 3D data assets that we desperately need to mobilize. And so that's um, a key priority for us. Just going to wrap up basically by talking about where the cash is coming from. So we've been very lucky in trying to get the attention of our uh, national research funder, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And we have this stream of basically, I wouldn't say constant cash, but this stream of about 150,000 a year, which is really helping us to galvanize the UK community. We also, through that and through the work that we've done making that business case, trying to unlock a national fund for digitization. And I am very hopeful, fingers crossed, 
um, uh, if everything comes together in the way that it's looking like, that will launch next year, and that will launch to the tune of hopefully tens of millions. It's in that sort of order of magnitude. I have to say there's a bit of dynamism in terms of the UK political landscape just at the moment. So we'll, we'll, I'm still holding my thing, crossing my fingers, but fingers crossed that comes together. And the last thing to think about before, and I want to close on this, is that there's really an emerging need about bringing all the skills and capabilities, particularly in this space, to do with exploiting that data. And there's a couple of examples of uh, different research domains in the UK that have done this. One is the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's centre for data expertise, and another is the Francis Crick Institute, which is more biomedical. And these are serving as interesting models for our community in terms of how we um, uh, might move forward in the context of either a physical or a virtual centre. And at that point, I'm being told to stop, so I will finish there. Thank you very much. We do have questions in the room. Thank you for those very interesting. I I'm, uh, have really one question. Uh, I understand the need to justify the investment of digitizing collections. I'm just very much kind of suspicious about that amount of two to two billion pounds. That is the the amount of money that could be saved by doing this. I'm suspicious about what's the methodology to make this estimation and how much trust can we have in that? So that's not the money that's going to be saved. That's the money that would actually be generated, the economic benefits of that. Um, it's not a saving as such. Um, uh, I guess there's the, the short, the longer answer is if you, I can't go back. If you look back at the that slide, there we go. Um, there's a DOI up there to the paper the documents, the methodology, there it is. Um, it's published in Rio. It was published jointly between NHM and our consultants. Um, that explains that theory of change, change methodology and how they arrived at that figure. Um, right now, we're actually following this work up with another consultant, McKinsey, and we're doing much more work to basically look at the individual costs. So for each item digitized and the outcome, that's associated with that, what is the value of that process? And partly I want to literally sort of present a virtual bill to some of our funders to say, look, your researchers are doing all this work that's enabled by these collections. This is the cost of it. Would you help us to pay? Um, I, I mean, because it is literally at that level that these conversations are at. So if you want the detail, I would suggest you go there. But it's it's basically a theory of change methodology, which is the kind that UK government treasury use in terms of trying to estimate value of benefits. And Tim, maybe. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question before we need to switch. Hi, Vince. Um, so I'm aware of the British situation, but I think it's a similar situation in other big countries in that a lot of the smaller institutions have collections that are really not used at all. And there is value in having local collections in the local area for local people to use. But many of the British uh, museums have international collections, type specimens, really valuable stuff, and they're really not set up for being scientific collections. They haven't got barcodes, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Et cetera. So how are you how are we going to do that? Okay, I switched to this because it really relates to this emerging vision about central, regional, and, and kind of these little, these much smaller nodes. So the bottom line is that many of those regional collections, they really want to establish a more comprehensive program of digitization. But those smaller collections really don't have the means, the wherewithal, the infrastructure, even the vision in some cases. They've got a small, often very valuable part of their collection they'd like to mobilize. So at that level, that kind of node level, it's more about project-led digitization. They've got this really cool piece of their collection, someone super keen on mobilizing that and they will digitize that in partnership with their regional um, uh, hub. Um, uh, they won't essentially be undertaking a complete 
digitization effort simply because it's well beyond them. And so it's more that digitization on demand model that for those smaller collections we're um, pursuing at the moment. Uh, that's partly funding related as well. Thank you. So next up is my colleague Katja Luther from the Botanic Garden Botanical Museum as well. And she's going to talk about NFDI for biodiversity. So can you hear me or okay. yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I first have to arrange everything. So I want to present today the NFTI for biodiversity, a German infrastructure for biodiversity data. I present, present this work together with Anton Günsch, David Püchtmüller from the BGBM in Berlin and Birgitta könig uh, from the University in Jena. But the work is done with all the partners of the huge uh, um, initiative. <clears throat> so I think we all saw these uh, principles a lot in the last days, but I think it's always valuable to see it again. So. What we want to have are fair data. That means findable, accessible, and also interoperable and reusable data. And I like this lost data map a lot because it shows in a very nice way where the data yeah, are lost <laughs> after several years after publication and are not use reusable anymore. So, we want to uh, yeah, reduce the risk of uh, actual desert or mountains of external hard drives and want to archive the <clears throat> data that is produced by biodiversity and environmental uh, research. So the problem is not new and there were several projects already in Germany which deals with the problem of uh, well, the goal to archive the um, data produced by the research project. There were the German Astrophysical Virtual Observatory, which connect the German data to the International Global Virtual Observatory. And then there were for ecologic, uh, economical, <laughs> Uh, social and um, educational data, the German Data Forum, which also develops a network for research data centers. And last but not least, the German Federation for Biological Data, also known as G GSBio, <clears throat> which forms a network uh, for hosting data of biological, uh, biodiversity and environmental uh, research. But all these um, projects were funded for some years, but then the funding stopped and they were not sustainable, sustainability, sustainable, no, sorry. And um, yeah, if we archive anything and it's not sustainable, it doesn't, uh, yeah, we didn't reach the goal. So the, in Germany, there were, it was, uh, there was an initiative to create a national um, research data infrastructure. In German, that means Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur, NSDI. And um, they decided that they will fund up to 30 domain related uh, converter. That means they want to give the yeah, the work to the communities and that they should think about how to create such an infrastructure for their research data. Yeah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> My head is too small. Worry. Just let it go. Yeah. Oh. 
Hold your key. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two, three, you're ready. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, the, the NFDI um, be, um, cont uh, includes up to 200 members that are um, the most of the university's um, research um, institutes and also um, federal institutions. So here you can see a map of all the members uh, belonging to the NFDI association. So, but we are on TEDWIC and so we want to talk about the biodiversity data and also about the um, NFDI consortium for biodiversity. So the, we already saw that there were um, a project called GFBio which handles the problems of the biodiversity research. And um, we can see this as the roots of the NFDI for biodiversity. So the core of the GF Bio network were 10 data centers. Um, three uh, were specialized on nucleotide, plant and environmental data. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the remaining seven were data centers at natural science collections. So, for example, um, we are also a data center for in, for um, yeah sign for the science collection. And um, all these data centers uh, archiving and uh, the data they get from GF Bio. And they uh, also provide services to uh, improve the data. So that means that they have a workflow that um, contains um, completeness checks, um, checks for maybe some mistakes that are in the <clears throat> in the data. For example, with OpenRefine or with the um, diversity workbench. <clears throat> So um, this is uh, the picture or slide about what services are already existing. So um, there were a, a really successful uh, portal <clears throat> from which uh, the researchers can uh, get uh, help for data submission. So they can uh, use a a tool to create a data management plan. They can submit their data. They can search the data that are already somewhere in the data centers. And for georeference data, there's also the possibility to visualization of the data. Uh, also very important is that there are already a terminology service available which uh, contains uh, several uh, ontologies which can be used to uh, annotate and enrich the data. <clears throat> so, but now we come to the actual um, project. This project is uh, NFDI for biodiversity. So we are a consortium of the um, bigger NFDI. Um, the NFDI is, uh, or the, the project is divided in two phases. The first phase is uh, about, um, yeah, to find uh, the needs and the services uh, the community needs. And so I have to hurry up a little bit. Um, the first thing, or one of the first things we, we do in NFDI for biodiversity is to find as many use cases as possible to find out the needs of our community. So we have, at the moment, we have 26 use cases with very different um, needs and data, and they all are distinct pro projects, and um, they take about th th uh, three years. Um, the goal is to find out what uh, kind of data they have, 
what kind of uh, help they need to uh, mobilize this data. So you can say, make it fit for sharing. <clears throat> then if you have so many different data, it is important to have standards. So um, we have to find out what standards can be used. Maybe we have to uh, create new standards, but mostly we want to use existing standards. Um, also important is a lot of these communities already have uh, um, software that is uh, what they need and what they use for their um, for their work workflows. And we want to provide the software or the workflows for the whole community. So only for yeah, to see which use cases we already have. Um, yeah. So actually, we are in the phase where we want to find out which services we need and which services we already have. So we already have all the services coming from GF Bio. So, for example, the support with integration and harmonization of the data coming from the data centers. Um, and but also what an important thing is that we want to provide uh, education and training for researchers to create data that is uh, what we can uh, provide and reuse. So just very short, <laughs> the research data common is the um, infrastructure we want to um, implement for NFDI for biodiversity, but also for NFDI. So it uh, space uh, or the name comes from the Australian research data commons, which is already a um, successful infrastructure for research data. So um, only three, <laughs> the three uh, layers. We have the base with the cloud where all data is stored and um, a mediation layer with, for data transformation and curation. Um, this is the layer, the submission is uh, communication with, uh, communicate with, and then a semantic layer with uh, tools and everything that provide the community related uh, or yeah, improved data to the users. Okay, now I was <laughs> too long, <laughs> but um, yeah, I thank you for uh, the, yeah, and I thank all our partners and uh, yeah, well, if you have any you. questions. Well, we went a little bit over time. Uh, if you have, if we have one quick question, we might squeeze it in, otherwise we, uh, continue with the next talk no quick questions maybe maybe just oh, rapidly okay. as as it's as this is from germany uh, we are using the the galaxy platform which is managed by uh, freiburg university so please for workflow sharing tool sharing uh, please look at galaxy for ecology initiative uh, and colleagues from freiburg university i think it can be a, a quick win win for you Okay, thank you. So next up is Sophia Radcliffe about the uh, the rest of the questions we will answer in this lecture. Yeah, uh, yeah, about the National Biodiversity Network Atlas. Do you have a scissors? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hold your mm -hmm. there. Brilliant. Do you feel good? Yeah, we're oh, good. good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much um, to Anton for the invitation to talk today. Um, are we up? Okay, great. Um, yes, I'm Sophia Ratcliffe from the MBN Trust in the UK. I'm the data manager for the MBN Atlas, which is the UK's uh, biodiversity data portal. 
And yeah, I'm going to introduce the, the MBN Trust, the Atlas, and the challenges that we've had and some of the solutions we've had to overcome them. I first just wanted to introduce the Trust. Uh, we're a small charity, and uh, the first thing that we do is coordinate the National Biodiversity Network, which is the network that Vince spoke about um, in his talk. It's a, um, a membership of over 200 organizations and individuals across the UK who are involved in the curation, the collection, the use and the reuse of biodiversity data in the UK. And many of these individuals, the organizations that uh, you can see there, contribute records, share records to the MBN Atlas. Um, the MBN Atlas is um, uh, an instance of the Atlas of Living Australia. I think we're the largest um, instance with just over 200 million records. We have the main Atlas for the UK, which covers UK, Isle of Man and Channel Islands, and then the individual countries within the UK, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and also the Isle of Man have their own individual atlases that are sort of a cookie cutter set of data that come from the main atlas. Um, we tried to have a look uh, a year or so ago, along with the Biological Record Centre and the Marine Biological Association on the how data swirls around the MBN Atlas and this is somehow what we came up with. The 90% of our records are field observations. So they have a basis of record of human observation and they are ad hoc occurrences um, in the field and also uh, surveys. Um, the majority of those come from the recording schemes and societies and the environmental NGOs. We have um, quite a lot of survey records come from government agencies. Guys, something, have I done something? All right. Um, and we're trying to improve that flow of record from, records from the government agencies into the Atlas. We have a semi-automatic flow of, um, of marine records from the Biological Association, their DASH portal. And we also receive records monthly from iRecord. iRecord is a website and app um, managed and hosted by the Biological Records Centre, and it enables wildlife recorders in the UK to share their records directly with the recording schemes and societies and make those identifications, those records available for verification. And where they agree, the Biological Records Centre then shares those records with the MBN Atlas on a monthly basis. There's also a, da a daily um, import of records from iNaturalist UK into iRecord making those records from my naturalist available to, um, uh, to the verifiers for then sharing on with the MBN Atlas. Who uses the data? I just really wanted to focus on the academic use of the records on the MBN Atlas because then it, the uh, university community is not really, hasn't traditionally been part of the MBN. They are, but then, then nothing like the other the recording schemes and societies and the statutory bodies. Uh, but we're seeing a huge uptake of use of Atlas records by um, academia, both researchers and also uh, universities, um, students, PhDs, masters. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to spend some more time producing resources, producing videos, our scripts to um, support that use. Interestingly, also, universities have been approaching us to find out the biodiversity records that they hold on their estates. They're looking at doing biodiversity um, assessments of their lands and also encouraging their students and staff to record on their estates. And they're asking us for help with that. I wanted to talk about um, the customizations, which has given us quite a few challenges. Um, they're split in two when the, um, I mean, before the Atlas was launched, some customizations were added to the ALA core code the main one of which was grid references, to be able to share um, occurrence records using a grid reference rather than a lat long coordinate. Terrestrial recording in the UK is primarily done using um, uh, grid references, but ultimately they're stored in Darwin Core with the lat long and a coordinate uncertainty in meters. 
And we've done quite a lot of um, customizations to the Atlas fork to finish off the work with uh, grid references and make the um, coordinate uncertainty in meters work correctly. Um, other customizations that we've done on the for the M <clears throat> on the MBM fork include complete change to the species component so that it works well with the UK species inventory, which is a species dictionary that we use on the Atlas, which is managed by the Natural History Museum in London. A new advanced search that works better with the way that our um, community works using uh, grid references to search by and also geographical boundaries that are more suitable. Some of the challenges um, because of all these customizations, upgrading to the latest ALA platform has been a huge headache. And I'll come back next to how we've done that and how that might work well for other, um, other people who have used the ALA platform. The developers have been consolidating all the infrastructure to AWS, which has also been a headache, but that's made it much easier for them to monitor the servers and, and things have been much more stable since they've done that. And there are quite a few manual processes within the Atlas that our developers are slowly automating over time, notably the data processing, the monthly data processing schedule. They created run books and from them have automated the process, which has reduced stress a lot. In terms of data, um, it was really nice to hear uh, um, in Javier's talk this morning about support for event-based records. This is something that we desperately need on the MBN Atlas, those records, that, those uh, Darwin Core archives that we take from the Dash IPT are all event core focused. And I have to reformat them. I have a script to reformat them as to occurrence based. And so it would be great if going forward, we can work with event based records for all the reasons that Javier gave this morning. We need to be better at measuring impact. How comprehensive uh, an inventory of UK biodiversity data do we have on the MBN Atlas? Where are the gaps, the taxonomic, the spatial, the temporal gaps? What's the impact on our data set of a particular data provider sharing their records with us? These are really important, it's really important metrics that we can talk to our funders about, but feed back to those uh, data providers and, um, and make stories from to, to encourage data sharing. Slightly associated with that is tracking use. We very, we're very grateful to GBIF. We use their citation tracker for those data sets that we share with GBIF, but we do have data sets that we don't share and also people download records from the Atlas and we need to get much better, thank you, at tracking those. And data quality. We use the uh, user annotations functionality within um, ALA. So if someone sees an, an, an error on a, on a record, they can write a note. Um, feeding that information back to the data provider is manual. Um, it would be great if we could do those on bulk, in bulk. So those kind of data quality issues we really may need to be much more efficient about. This is our Fit for the Future project, which is how we are upgrading the Atlas to the latest version of the ALA code. And we're almost at the end of stage one and have more or less started stage two. So what our developers have done is taken all those UK customizations and it's from the ALA code and extracted them to a layer above the framework. And that's then allowed them to then just upgrade the ALA platform underneath, keeping the uh, UK customizations on top. And this seems to be working really well. And if there are any other ALA nodes that would like to know more about this, I think it's it's worked really well and our developers are really care to share, keen to share that knowledge. Stage three is to update, to migrate the data pipeline to um, the, the latest version. We're probably gonna pause this and wait for six months and come back to a few of the projects that we, uh, we've put on hold whilst we've been looking at how to make the Atlas more stable. And what are those? Um, we get starting to get eDNA um, data sets from Nature Metrics, and uh, we hope to have those uploaded to the Atlas by the end of the year and then shared with GBIF. Um, we are halfway through a project to allow our data partners to share their records at um, supplied resolution, but set the public resolution on the Atlas. Then behind the scenes, they would be able to give access to individuals to download the supplied resolution of those records. 
We hope that this will encourage greater data sharing so that they can put their records up publicly at a quite a low resolution as a signpost. This is the records that we've got. Um, and you contact the data provider to get access to the higher resolution. We have a plugin for not so beautiful maps, and we re we've got a request from a data provider to be able to produce beautiful maps. And I'm being told to stop. But lastly, we are really hoping to get greater collaboration with companies, environmental consultants. There's a lot of data held privately with environmental consultancies that we really want to get on the Atlas, and that's going to be our focus going forward. And yeah, thank you very much. That's me. Thank you for the presentation. Are there questions either in the room or online? And that was really fantastic. Uh, just curious to know, uh, so there has been a lot of examples of people implementing Atlas in different countries, right? So how much time did you took to implement Atlas and how, how easy what was it to use the code or use the code from okay, Atlas? So I should say I'm not a developer. So um, uh, I, and I only started three months after the Atlas was live. So I think that it took a lot of input, but I think the UK's expectations were quite high. They needed grid references. They needed access to um, the locations of, of um, sensitive species. So there were quite a few things that the UK recording community needed before we could push forward uh, and make it live. So I think the best thing is to talk to our developers and I can put you in touch with them. But certainly it's up and running. It's really stable. Um, everything that they've done in terms of um, Separating, separating out the code and um, separating, out, separating out those UK customizations and the, the manual steps, it's all documented, which it wasn't before. So there's much more documentation that they're very happy to share and, and offer support. So yeah, get in great. touch. Thanks so much. There's one question from Zoom, from Ivan. Um, it is NBN is only giving access to Darwin Core occurrences data, not to raw data sets. Um, are these data, CSV, XSL, um, shape files in another data warehouse or several warehouses? No, you can download records from, from the NBN Atlas. We, we don't allow shape file downloads just because they cause so much problems from the, in the Atlas. Oh, sorry. Is okay. um, but, but yes, you can, you can download. CSV files of, of records, but we do share Darwin Core archives with Jeeva as well. Well, thank you so much again. Um, so we just heard uh, the NVN Atlas being closely related to the Atlas of Living Australia, which gives me the perfect segue to introduce uh, Peggy Newman. Um, we have a video from her, but she is on the chat, and oh, we always see her on the screen. Um, Hello there. So <laughs> she will be able to answer questions later on in, uh, in live. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peggy Newman. I'm the data manager of the Atlas of Living Australia, or the ALA and the co-convener of the Machine Observations Interest Group here at Tadwig. Today I'm talking about my day job, the ALA, and how we've grown into an organisation of around 50 people and the sorts of projects that we're working on. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm speaking to you from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay respect to Elders past and present. It's important to me to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that we honour and celebrate traditional owners' connection to country and to biodiversity. My intention today is to give a quick run through of the ALA's greatest hits of the last year, highlighting our major projects and hopefully demonstrating to you the range of work that we cover and how much we value collaboration in getting our work done. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the ALA, how it works and where it's funded from, the events uh, system that we've been building and how we've 
intend on working on the unified model. Work we've been doing around sensitive species, a new platform we've been building for genomics data, some issues around taxonomy that we're having, and uh, some work on Indigenous ecological knowledge. And I'll give you a final list of other initiatives as well, just for completeness, I guess. To begin with, uh, just a quick overview of the ALA. So we're funded um, in two major ways by NCRIS, which is a National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, and CSIRO is our host organisation, so the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. Most of you know that we're the Australian node of GBIF, and we also support local nodes of iNaturalist and the Biodiversity Heritage Library. So aside from our currents, our currents and species services, we also support and host multiple applications. For example, Digivol for crowdsource, crowdsource digitisation, which is a collaboration with the Australian Museum, BioCollect and Merit for field data collection, and Zoltrack for biologging data. We're not funded by uh, state and federal environment departments, but we do have close working relationships with them, as we do our national and state museums and collections. Our vision is to deliver trusted biodiversity data services. And at the moment, we're sitting on just over 110 million occurrence records across 800 or so data sets, and we've got about 108,000 registered users in our system. So moving on to probably what is our most prolific project this year, extending the data model. Two years ago, we built a new data ingestion pipeline in collaboration with GBIF, which allowed us to share code and manage um, and replace our underlying infrastructure using GBIF's experience as a guide for managing these increasing data volumes. Our community consultation work told us that simple occurrence model is insufficient for um, ecological analysis tasks like inferring absence or doing time series uh, analysis. We decided to pursue changes to our data model to include event core by adding a separate event entity and index into the data store. You can see some screenshots here from our pilot UI and there's some links to on my slides if you're interested in going to have a look. As part of this work, we've also engaged Simon Cox, a CSIRO research scientist who's got extensive experience with semantic web and developing global uh, geospatial standards with OGC and W3C. And Simon will be working on um, building an ontology for aspects of the unified model with John Rhetoric and Tim Robertson. Our future vision is to continue to collaborate with GBIF and the broader community on the development of the unified model. In terms of this project, my colleague Javier Molina is going to uh, has given a talk on this project in a session earlier today, and I've added links here um, to more information about this project and also uh, to his abstract. Go and take a look. In terms of the sensitive species, so as I said earlier, our funding is research-based, but we are strengthening our connections to our state and federal um, conservation agencies. So on this project, the Restricted Access Data Framework Every Australian state and territory, the Commonwealth and other peak community bodies have partnered with us to develop a consistent approach to managing and sharing sensitive species data in Australia. Uh, part of this is our sensitive data service or SDS, which takes in lists of sensitive species from each state and during our data ingestion process, um, uh, we obscure species locations from the public view according to rules that each state specifies. And then there's a governance process for releasing that data um, to trusted, um, to trusted uh, researchers. The project seeks um, to develop standardised approaches to governance um, for licensing, for access and authority, for the methods of obfuscation and um, and ways that we might seek to deal with other types of sensitivity in data, for example, privacy or embargo, um, or embargo um, obfuscated data. I might also mention that during the year we've met with FinBIF and we've been really, really interested in the, in the model that um, they've used to approach these, these problems. Moving on to uh, genomics. 
we're building a platform called the Australian Reference Genome Atlas or ARGA. Now that uh, in that we're intending to consolidate genomic data for Australian native or agricultural species from various international repositories. So NCBI GenBank, the European nu nu Nucleotide Archive and um, Bioplatforms Australia. We're building an ingestion pipeline and an index um, so that you can search uh, for genomic data by species, location and functional classification. And we're partnering, partnering with other INCRIS agencies on this project. So the Australian Research Data Commons, Bioplatforms Australia and the Australian Biocommons. We're expecting this platform to be released next year. In terms of taxonomy, it's become a really big focus for us since we've been working on these projects with our national authorities on sensitive species and biosecurity, it's become really important that our taxonomic backbone is accurate and trustworthy. Basically, we build our own taxonomic index by combining taxonomies from 10 or so national authorities and what we call our large taxon collider. Uh, this index then sits behind a names matching API and we use that API to augment occurrence records um, with everything we know about that taxon. Building our taxonomic backbone is completely systematic, systematic and it works really well for a lot of scenarios, but there are some problems with it. It's slow. Um, melding the authoritative sources is complicated and states have their own views of taxonomy. All of these things present a lot of problems. I can't say too much about the solution right now because we don't really know what it looks like. We do know that what we want to do is leverage domain expertise. We want to reuse existing tools wherever possible and we want to be transparent and collaborative so everybody can reuse the work um, that we do. Um, this is a major priority for us. Uh, if you're interested in uh, understanding a little more, little more about the inner workings of the large taxon collider, um, I recommend seeing Doug Palmer's talk tomorrow in Symposium 4. Uh, On to Indigenous ecological knowledge. So we've been supporting many projects with multiple Indigenous language groups across Australia to collect language and knowledge about plants and animals. There's been several projects over the past few years involving on-country workshops, field trips and consultations with traditional owners, language centres, ecologists and botanists. Ultimately, the work is about language preservation. And in the ALA, we now have language names for many species and knowledge sharing. For example, you can see here on the slide, many different language names for emus that the projects have gathered. A feature of this work is that there's a really strong and multi-step consultative process for gathering this knowledge and obtaining consent from traditional owners to share it publicly. I've shared some links here to some more information uh, and some examples. I especially recommend to go and have a look at the Noongar Wuljari Plant and Animal Online Encyclopedia. So just before I close, I'd like to show you, uh, uh, just talk about some of the other little things we've been doing around the Atlas, not so little. Um, we're looking at a much needed um, UI refresh, um, my data team has been working on automating data loads. So we've got a lot of data providers who um, deliver data across APIs or just have large data sets. So we've been developing a Python framework um, to automate data ingestion and work with Durham Core Archives. Mahmoud Sadegi has done a talk, talk earlier this week um, in a symposium on our pre-ingestion framework, and I'll put a link to that on the slide. We're building an IT roadmap that will guide us in our future application development, mostly focusing on front-end technologies uh, that we'd like to use and software reuse. Um, we've put out a call for grants for data mobilization and have a number of new data sets in the works from our collections community, which is pretty exciting. On the science side, um, we've been working with national biosecurity authorities to set up alerts on incoming occurrence records. There's challenges for this around taxonomy, as one might expect. Um, we have the S ECHO Assets Program, which is um, using ALA data to inform national state of the environment indicator reporting. 
And our science team has been doing a lot of work in R. So we've got our R package Galar, which is available on CRAN. And um, they've been working on um, exemplars of working with ALA data in R on our ALA Labs site. So that's a new site at labs, ALA, labs.ala.org.au. So in closing, I'd like to summarise by saying it's a really privileged position for the ALA to be able to work with our international community on standards and data mobilisation and share those benefits and learnings in our collaborations with our Australian biodiversity informatics community. Thanks for listening. Um, see you all later. Well, Peggy, thank you so much for uh, the, the, arc, the presentation. Um, First of all, not so much a question, but a comment from my side as somebody who has a fascination with the maps, particularly old maps. I really like the here be dragons in the graphic. And I think we should do that more often to demonstrate the known unknowns or potential problems within our workflows. Are there any questions in the room or in the chat or um, Discord to, uh, sorry, not Discord, Slack, of course, um, to Peggy? There is one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Peggy. It's uh, Damiano Aldoni here from uh, Research Institute Nature and Forest, Belgium. Uh, oh, hi. Hi. I see in your slides um, about biosecurity alerts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm curious about how far you are in that, in implementing that. Oh, that's a really good question. I can probably put you in touch with the people who are working on it, um, because at my end, I often hear that we're having issues with taxonomy. Um, and I know that we've, um, you know, are trying to approach that problem from a number of different directions. I believe what we've done is um, really just tried to use an, an in-house uh, alert system that um, informs people of changes it, you know, sends out emails based on basic uh, certain queries, um, uh, and I think that what we've what we've done is, um, you know, are starting to um, look at using an R package um, to, to do that uh, to do that work. But I can't um, I can't answer that with a lot of knowledge. What's really important to us is that we're engaging with the biosecurity authorities and um, trying to work these problems out together. Thanks. But Damiana, if you're interested in um, in speaking more about it, I'll put you in touch with um, the people who are working on it. Yeah, thanks. Definitely. Cool. So thanks again, Peggy, also for staying up so late. Okay. <laughs> it's not Next. so late here. Thanks very much and enjoy the conference, everyone. <laughs> So next up is Elaine van Omen Klerk. I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly. <laughs> With the Arise project from the Netherlands. Special treatment, huh? So uh, is everyone still awake? Or did you hear enough about all of these national infrastructures? Well, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak today. And uh, I'd like to tell you more about the Dutch uh, national infrastructure that we're currently building. Uh, let's see how this works, as it had to be in PDF. Well, luckily, this is one of the first times I do not need to explain how important biodiversity is. Usually I have an audience that meh, kind of knows there's human beings and bugs and that's it. Uh, and I'm also quite lucky that we're talking about the Netherlands. So we only have about 43,000 species. So I cannot imagine how this would be if I was in Brazil, for instance. Still, 43,000 species, and many of those are actually quite hard to observe. Uh, and even if they are observable, you know, there are species that are not really there to be captured. So 
we're trying to basically identify any species in any location in the Netherlands, whether it's a fungi, a bug, a bird, all of it. And by now we know that only 5% is vertebrate. It means there's a huge part that's insects, that are fungi, which you cannot just observe um, using your mobile phone, for instance, or doing a survey. So where do we want to move to? Obviously, the future would be that you just have a drop of water and you know exactly what's out there. That would be ideal, autonomous, but we need technology to get there. So Arise is really focusing on two core identification technologies. On the one hand, DNA, knowing all the barcodes for all the species so we can move into the environmental DNA corner. And sensor technology, obviously not this one, right? That's the one for uh, recording this, uh, this presentation, but more these kind of fellows. Autonomous sensors in the field, 4G connections, solar panels, working 24 seven. Obviously everything in between because we also have SD cards and lots of other troubles, but this is the future of autonomous monitoring, at least for particular groups. And obviously it doesn't solve everything. You probably need everything. So how do we complement each other? Now that also means there's a huge part of this infrastructure that focuses on digital services. If you collect thousands or millions of records of images, of course you have to do some manual labor, but not all. So how can the AI help us there? And it also becomes more interesting because the AI also helps us to not just identify one species, but multiple species, help us count, help us see the species interactions. Now it does require quite some interoperability. Hooray, that's why we're here, right? That's uh, exactly what this conference is about. And once it's connected, you can really start asking the ecological questions. So far, no brainer. This is you, right? This is preaching to the choir, I know. So what are we up to? In a nutshell, this is a very basic picture of what Arise should look like in the near future. We're a bit of a startup. We're, we're kind of operational for one year. So we still need to get, uh, get somewhere. But what we're trying to achieve, because it's a lot of work, to work end to end. So I have to say no quite frequently. This is what we're not going to do. This is not what we're not going to do right now. But how do we deliver focused on an end user? So making sure a researcher actually has something to work with. One of the core deliverables is a so-called species reference database. I don't think it's a database, especially in this crowd. It's more like uh, our Australian colleague said, Atlas something that connects all the data or various databases. And it actually goes beyond just the data and the metadata around a particular species. It also is about sensors, deployment, algorithms, the user, and how is that all interconnected and, and which kind of layer do you need to put on top given a particular question. So we tend to use use cases to work out these end-to-end. -end. So I'll take you through two of these. First one is when you're collecting in the field, you need to collect, you need to, the lab for the IDing, you need to store the data somewhere, you need to expose it, and there will be people that want to explore this data set. Now, just a, brief, a few highlights of where we are. It actually starts with that question, what data do we still need? So right now we've completed a gap analysis for as much DNA barcoding information we have in the Netherlands to even know how far are we? based on everything that we are scraping together. Using the Naturalis database, the Westerdijk database, and the bold global database, we can say just under 60% of the Dutch species, we have a known barcode. That means there's still 40% missing. Thanks. So creating a lab facility to get it done, but also how can we make it easier for users to help us out? How do we send researchers but also the non-experts in the field to collect our data so we're now kind of kind of prototyping and this is a this is a, a wireframe and will be an mvp february uh, where we say how can we make it so simple for a field worker to actually collect it click on it and start capturing the metadata instantly so that the collection managers don't have to go through this pain of collecting emails or excel sheets with numbers fields we actually make it super simple um, it also means we need to have a core 
database or framework where all of the data from the DNA comes together. We don't have this right now. It's on USB drives. It's on an institutional drive. It's everywhere. So how do we actually make sure it comes together and it's, it's, it's interpretable? People can actually use it. I don't have all the answers yet. Hopefully next year I'll be invited back and can give you a demo. But this is something that we're still, uh, still figuring out. Now we're a bit further with this use case where we have a sensor in the field. And in this case, it's very boxed off to insect cameras. Can we do the same? Collect the data. How does that work through 4G and FTP service? Store it, ID it, expose it. And here, this of course, we can then transpose to other sensors. We've already tested out roughly six sensors and they require a huge amount of data storage. Where do you put that? It also means different data types may use different AI. So we need an AI repository. There's not gonna be one identification model. There will be a hundred maybe. So that was one of the first things that also that team required to do, create a repository so that any one of you that has an identification model can basically put it there and we make sure it's deployable, click and play. So what do we want? Drag and drop your images, select your algorithm, analyze, click, play, that's the goal. So what does it look like today? I'll just quickly jump through it. They have a front end now, it's in a test phase. But this is exactly what it does. You go to the media browser, you already sieve out the data that you don't want to get analyzed because it's empty. You, you search for the available algorithms. Right now it's for the Diopsis camera specifically and for sound. And ultimately you end up with an analysis that shows you exactly which box plots have been used, which species have been recognized with the accuracy. Now that's one of the services that we want to have. There's lots and lots more. So please come and talk to me <laughs> if, you, if you want to find out more. What's behind it is obviously a huge data management challenge. Shouldn't say problem, challenge. So where are we? Uh, we've decided with the data architects to actually go for sort of the next generation data management system and which requires a data lake house. It means it allows structured and semi-structured data. It also means there is a, a middleware layer that harmonizes that data and that you actually put the services on top of all of this, rather than trying to merge everything in a very bespoke manner or being super strict with everything. There needs to be provenance, traceability. Of course, data objects must be uniquely identifiable with permanent identifiers. Um, external data objects reside in their original systems and are connected through the identifiers and metadata. And then of course, proper handling of ownership, access control and licensing. Not too much to ask, right? Um, it will take some time, and this has been our biggest hurdle so far, but bit by bit, we're getting here. What does it look like? Uh, we have chosen to work with uh, two systems. One is called IROTS, and the other one is called Delta Lake. And you see that the IROTS basically is in charge of the actual original data bits, or the, the payload, as we call it, so a specimen, an image, a sound, and then the metadata is handled by the Delta Lake through tables that have all kinds of objects in tables specified with PIDs. So the permanent uh, persistent identifiers. That is then connected to the species identification engines, to the APIs, and basically analysis is then back again, stored with the original data as new payload. And if we can do this for the Opsis, we can transpose again to all the other kinds of data sets out there. In a nutshell, that's a rise. Obviously, we're not on our own. Uh, it's been great seeing all the talks here, learning what others are doing. We're not saying we are the golden truth um, and we'd like to connect where possible because anything I don't have to build, I'm more than happy to take from somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. That was a perfect landing in terms of time. So um, are there any questions in the room or online? There is. Hello. Hello. Sorry, I'm Ariana from NHM. That was really, really cool. Um, I was just wondering, why did you, I thought you would start with maybe one type of data set, 
not just do images and sound and everything else? Is there a reason why you didn't just stick with one? Uh, there's a very human reason <laughs> why that happens. So I'm the program manager and I tell them off saying like, nope, you have to choose two says one. And then you kind of see the teams going to work autonomously. And then you kind of find out on the roadmap, suddenly there's something seeping up again. I mean, this is a sort of a, a balancing of wanting to really stay focused, but also, of course, uh, you know, harnessing the power of the teams themselves and how they can self-organize the work. So in this case, it's two data types, but the core 90% focus will be on images. And then, you know, that's also why we just started with the genomic data. We kind of left it for the, for the one first, first year. And now we have enough experience with the data structures we can start the rest, but it's it's a very human habit, especially in academia, to just go for everything at the same time. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, Steve Baskoff. Um, I was very interested in your uh, little bounding boxes on your images and you're talking about sound. The I'm just wondering, Audubon Core within the last couple of years has been struggling to come up with uh, standardized ways for describing sequences of sound and regions of interest. I'm wondering whether you've tried using any of that. And if you haven't, please come and talk to the Audubon Core uh, maintenance group because we uh, would love to have like implementers to actually try using the standards. I think actually one of our researchers called Dan Stoll is in, uh, involved in that group. Okay, great. If Great. Then Dan's, <laughs> he's in the group. Yeah. Great. Okay, we are doing quite well on time, so we have one more question um, online, and it's uh, Ivan. Do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask the question directly? Yeah, thank you. Just uh, rapidly uh, on the data harmonization, uh, you are presenting uh, uh, some metadata, pro metadata. But if you want to go further, if you want to to propose a way that uh, you can harmonize metadata on uh, certain details, for example, uh, capturing all the attributes or the primary variables from uh, DNA sensor or thing like that, do you have plan to do that or not? If I understand your question correctly, do we try to basically capture each individual metadata object that correct and harmonize harmonize metadata yeah. but in a detailed uh, way in fact uh, for example having all the primary variables you capture with dna yeah. and and so yeah. on yeah um we haven't come to the final list yet but as much detail as possible and necessary right so also raw data will be very important for us for instance to capture and how is that connected then to the uh, analyze data so as as much as possible and each with their own persistent identifier so you can trace back and also connecting to of course the laboratory system so we're still going to implement the limb system that also captures their own metadata who's been in the lab what primer was used uh, that metadata will also be connected so thanks again um and i guess we see you next year when you can present what was already working from so. your ambitious plans <laughs> So next up is Damiano uh, Oldoni <laughs> with the Live Reparis uh, project. Yes, thanks. Yes, thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Damiano Aldoni uh, from Research Institute Nature and Forest in Belgium. I will speak to you a little about um, our early alert system and the workflow that we have using in Life Repairs project, which is uh, GPF mediated. So, ah, yes, very important. First of all, I will speak about the project and the objectives, the goals, and then the data workflow, the early alert, and then some discussions. First of all, it's a live project. That means that um, it's a quite practical project. It has to, um, it's not data project based. It's uh, about 
invasive species and the management of it. So field managers and researchers want to know how feasible is the management of some established species from the European list of um, invasive species. Um, also, they want to eradicate as early as possible some emerging invasive alien species to save money. As early you you work, as early early you find as emerging species, faster you act, less money you have to spend because they are not established. Data speaking, we need to know where these species are as soon as possible. I speak about uh, occurrence data, observation data now. And the idea is to centralize, standardize, and transfer this data to European and global infrastructures. And as I said, we need to inform field managers where these species are as soon as possible. So we speak about an alert system. This is how it was in the project proposal. So first centralize and standardize, and then transfer to GB, for example. That's very important. With, we will come to this very, very soon, because we think to switch this and to make GB center point of this tail. First of all, we publish the checklist of this project to GBIF. So if everybody knows about which species we are speaking. It's a, it, we speak about a river, a riparian uh, plants and some crayfishes. We have a diversity in organizations. As you know, GBIF, um, Belgium is quite complicated, uh, politically speaking. And also we have three ministers of environment. So the data are very scattered and segmented. So we have to deal with a lot of organizations providing data. A diversity in data sources, of course. So this is quite a challenge. The idea that we had then when we had to implement this is, uh, well, we can... Uh, point of this. Yes. But this organization will have some databases, some some they have no databases. Anyhow, we have to map this data to Darwin Core and do it again and again, so in a kind of automatic way. And then we have to publish this data to GBIF again in a in a as frequently as possible. This is not a challenge because uh, GBIF has an uh, Auto, auto publication setting. So this is quite easy. And uh, this is not impossible. So why not using GBIT then as a key point and base to get our data afterwards and to build the early alert tool based on GBIF. Here is also point that uh, we don't need to map data from a naturalist, and we don't need to map invasive alien species uh, that uh, uh, one naming.be and observation.be are publishing to GBIF uh, at monthly, uh, monthly based. There is already an early, early alert tool in Belgium. Yes. So why to create a new one? We don't like to invent uh, hot water or the wheel, but we need it because uh, web naming.be, observation.be is a single data source. So we need to have much more data. We need to use this data so we couldn't use this early alert. It's quite, it's very good. So if you're in Belgium, use it. It's not a problem, it's very good. And we used some, uh, we use this as a prototype um, for our email notification, for example, yes. So this is our Life Repairs Early Alert tool. It's a web application, alert.repairs.be. The link will be at the end of the of slides. It's uh, open source, so please use it and develop uh, if you want something similar. The data are imported every night from GBIF. You can click on the GBIF download and you get the very same data that we used. You can explore observation, map view or table view. You can set 
you can sign in, sign up, make your own uh, alerts uh, based on some filters on species, areas, data sets that you want to, to get. And the email notification frequency, for example, daily, weekly, monthly, never. And uh, you have always kind of notification here about uh, how many observations you still not have seen. So for example, 426, 406, uh, for example, 218, just because uh, a new bunch of data have been published to GBIF uh, yesterday. So there is this seen unseen observation lag, uh, flag uh, as typical, no, as a kind of emails. You can click on it and then the observation becomes unseen. And this is the typical email notification that uh, we get some inspiration from, uh, from observation.be, for example, to have a kind of small table here with uh, some examples of uh, observation, the link to the alert page, some the, the alert details here, the name of your alert here, and the number of unseen observation also in the subject. Well, the technology is used to surprise to for Nico. He called it his five minutes of glory on Twitter because uh, he never had idea that uh, this Twitter post had so many likes and retweets. And then we thought, well, maybe we have, we could present this <laughs> because it seems that there are people that would like to, to do what we are doing. So yes, it's based on uh, PostGIS and um, Python because it's uh, Django model view template. Uh, well, it's um, with some kind of further development that we want to do, improving, increasing the frequency of data publication on GBIF, publishing some media, so pictures, um, probably adding some areas that are more useful for the field managers, those so subunits of the river units, extend the species list to the list of invasive alien species of union concern that could be interesting in the afterlife of uh, this project. And then, of course, again, it's a practical project. Field managers don't use English as common language, so they prefer to have French and Dutch translation. Last but not least, that's why I asked to Peggy that question. Well, actually, why should, you can you imagine if you have a kind of early alert for everything, for collections, for, 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 for everything that we have on GBIF? If you are interested on something, you put uh, you set an alert and you get notifications when something is new is published. Well, now we have a code. We can ask to GBIF what they think about. And uh, But I see that uh, Peggy and uh, Atlas Living of Study is working on this, and we are quite happy that uh, we are on the same wavelength about that. Thank you. So thank you for the talk. Are there any questions from the room? First. So for alerting system, I can imagine you need to have a very fast upload. Right. So, what would what would be the basic requirements if GBIF would do such a thing? Right. Should do data providers need to do it instantly, real time? Because sometimes it's a monthly basis. That would not be quick enough for yeah. for invasive species. That's um, well. If you set an alert, still you have at least. Uh, I mean, you reduce uh, the the time from the right side, from the user side, and uh, of course, also everything depends on the left side of the ingestion of the data. But uh, that's depend on the data publishers, how frequently they publish their data, but that's not a user. It's a user problem, but it's something that the users cannot solve. So we try in our project to publish as fast as possible our data. But uh, again, there is a limit, for example, validation. They need to validate their own data. So sometimes the data come with a two weeks delay or for one month delay. Still for plants, it's not a huge problem because uh, plants don't move. So one month is still not a, a bad issue for crayfishes, yes. Still, the idea is to publish as fast as possible. 
and then uh, to speak with each, each organization to try to convince them to improve their own data flow in their own organization. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? Um, we are quite good on time, so I'm using the opportunity to um, yeah, uh, mention something that Anton has mentioned here in the uh, Slack channel. Um, so we, as in NFDI for Biodiversity in Germany, are planning on yeah, oh, yeah on making a publication um, that will define and promote the role of national data infrastructures for example, as a link between the international infrastructures and the local science and researchers. Um, so uh, if any of the initiatives here today or any other people are interested in collaborating on that, um, please get back to Anton. He's uh, managing this. Um, and I guess we have really a good potential to bring a lot of those players together, not just for the session today, but also for this publication and like defining what it is that yeah uh, makes us uh, uh, yeah what defines us and how we can uh, define our roles uh, which might also be helpful towards yeah local funders asking why do you need a national data infrastructure when there are already international ones okay then we are going to our last speaker um Kari Lati from Finland on uh, FinBev. Yeah, okay. Is it all? Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for the kind invitation to, to come and speak speak about something that is uh, very has been in a topic for of my interest for a long time uh, so the the narrative today uh, as it says in the title is the role and the purpose of national biodiversity data infrastructures in wider uh, uh, landscape so uh, this uh, view of mine i want to emphasize this is just a view and it's it's a view of through my experience of of uh, of uh, uh, starting building finbif from the scratch 7 years ago um and 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 and, and that's why um uh, this question has been raised many times that why do we need a national service instead of using global service GB, or why do we need to have local or institutional uh, um, services instead of using national services and I try to shed some light of what, uh, what we, our experience is about that and uh, as a background there's a lot of discussion at least nationally I'm sure also you have experienced the same that there's always a question of this kind that that w where should we invest to um, well the content I will just uh, you know talk you through of, of, of the different levels of, of what how i defined it this uh, uh, local national international and then i will uh, speak about some identified issues and conclusions conclusions uh, at the end of the day so i had to i made a little exercise myself for for get some clarity that what i'm talking about and i may use some simple <laughs> simple pictures and some simple symbols to to depict the, the differences of of, of uh, different level of, of, of uh, data infrastructures and uh, as you see the it's the size is definitely something that is obvious then again of course the content is obvious and also the access is obvious there it, it varies from from different level of of services i won't go much into detail to this i, I also did a kind of a little analysis myself that what are the, these services in Finland, for instance, that what is the local? It's it, it quite commonly based on commercial products it, or it is really homemade uh, product itself. And it has a limited usage because of its nature of not being openly accessible. Uh, also, it quite often it has a very specific task and it's tailor made and rarely fair compatible, not even because it hasn't been planned that way. Well, when I look at the national services, well, in my view, there like in our case, it's it's completely in house, but it can be improved commercial product, and as well as in in case of living atlases, it's it is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, co-developed uh, product product uh, and and very good of that kind. So there's quite wide usage. It serves multiple purposes. It has national task as as as, as a main core function tailored elements and it's fair ready. What I mean by fair ready that it's like it can be fair uh, compatible already or it can be converted to fair uh, compatible uh, with with uh, with some effort. The same thing with global, I won't go into detail. So it can be in-house, it can be co-developed, improved commercial. It has the widest usage, uh, it has global tasks and it's, it's just at the same time, it's a, it's a fair ready. So this is a, a, a practical um, um, uh, example of existing services. I want to just uh, demonstrate that actually what happens and why the all level, levels are important. So um, as you see the, in the left, you see the Parks and Wildlife Finland, who is managing and governing all protected areas in Finland, and they have lots of different kinds of uh, IT infrastructures uh, for, for instance, uh, for, for their own infrastructure in the field, or uh, for instance, uh, uh, they um, uh, the management planning systems as well as uh, species and habitat uh, monitoring etc and they're using argis as a basic so and there's a very strong firewall between so we cannot have an access to that data so we what we decided designed actually where we build an external data warehouse and they are pushing every week they're pushing the data through the firewall for us to access so what happens simplified picture here we just use the etl process to to get it into our system and it is divided automatically to open data warehouse and a restricted data warehouse and both of these have a, a, a place i mean a portal that can be accessed uh, uh, through through um, by by anybody and by authorities so um, more detailed about this what happens to the data so we have the open data warehouse and restricted but this is something that uh, we have found the most useful thing that also the restricted data has to be findable from the open data warehouse. And we have done that in a way that it's generalized information uh, uh, as, as it is. And that actually guarantees the findability. And this is the key thing. If, if, it does, if you cannot find it, it doesn't exist. So all the data which we have is findable through the open, open portal. So what happens here that, uh, well, as, as, as I mentioned, the first one is accessible and findable, this species the DeFi, and then the other one is authorized. You need to be a, a, a it's based on agreement. That's a long story. Anyway, uh, what you can do in the in the open open service browsing download API access and restricted data requests. This is another key thing that we have uh, found most useful. And what happens here that the browsing and download and API access is up for everyone, well, for all purposes. But if you want to have this restricted data, there's a request service that after this process, you will be authorized. And most users have been consultants, private sector researchers, et cetera, planning for decision making and research outcomes. Authorized, it's, it's uh, public authorities, for instance, regional environment centers, municipalities, state forest centers, state research institutes, et cetera. And this is mainly or purely for planning, for decision making and research outcomes used. So if I compare this now, this uh, uh, national service, well, the, the statement is, of course, the same as everybody who is working with FAIR, as open as possible, as restricted as necessary, not as close as necessary, though. So, uh, if we compare this uh, service with GBIF, what happens to GBIF? We are, we are connected to GBIF via API, and we are uh, pushing our data uh, every night to, to, to GBIF, but we can only publish the open data. And that, that is the biggest challenge from national point of view. In, in GBIF, you cannot find, you cannot uh, access to, to, uh, to restricted data. That is most useful when it comes to land use planning or decision making. If you think about, the, uh, let's say, uh, birds of prey nests, for instance, or some other uh, endangered species information, that those are the information that actually makes the decisions. They, they can you know, divert the loggings from somewhere. And that's why uh, we, we feel that uh, it's definitely, we, are, we love GBIF, it's great, great, great service, but we cannot use it for the national purpose as such. Right, and another example that we have is uh, like uh, just to showcase that it, it doesn't always go the same way as it does in the previous example, the data flow from Finball, which is uh, doing the uh, library of, of DNA barcodes, 
uh, in Finland, uh, it goes first to eyeball and then we read it through API to FinBIF to be able to connect with the species information we have. So what it means that the data flow order is not an order of usefulness, it's a matter of feasibility. So I will skip this, I don't have enough time. Anyway, the, uh, these are the, my conclusions or some, some comments so that what we have seen the, the biggest challenges is the digital transformation uh, creates a, a need for a cultural change strategy. This is something that probably you've all, all seen that culture is actually the biggest, biggest problem when it comes to opening and sharing data. Uh, most urgent development needs actually are coming from national, uh, actually concern national services. So the, the good thing is that also creating national uh, funding opportunities. Most of the development we do currently, it's, it's funded by, by some uh, like ministries or some other uh, institutions that are needing our services. We need to be agile. We need to be able to fulfill, fulfill and change the, like for instance, the agile tools development on the second point. Um, uh, and they are only possible to have be ag agile to, to make create quickly new tools to the to the service. It can be only done in local and national level. Also, some others uh, like a data quality assignment, what which we do uh, for all data that flows in. Uh, um, uh, in this case, it means that data set or data source can have a quality already but you can you can assign a, a data quality to any data point but it's only it's only possible as a national decision to make a, a like for instance the some of the sources can be considered as, as a trustworthy data to start with uh, same thing with uh, assigning a sensitive or restricted use data status and access principles uh, effective communication and interaction within within the uh, different players um, and also the reliability uh, trustworthiness uh, national level recognition like open data awards national uh, research infrastructure roadmap inclusion uh, core trust seal certification etc then a uh, few other things like interoperability if, if of course the the biggest challenge of all and then annotation and curation of the information in different services, whether it's a primary or secondary service, this is the problem probably we all face. And uh, finally, all levels need it, uh, local for specific tasks, national for aggregation and sharing, and international for big picture. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so this was quite a variety of uh, topics. Oh, no, sorry. First of all, are there any specific questions to Kari and his presentation? Hi. Just a curiosity. Uh, I'm curious about how, what is the percentage of data that you have to obscure? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have the precise answer, but it's not much, let's say 5%. But it's not only that we have three ways of doing it. So that a sense, we have a sensitive species list that includes about 150 species automatically uh, uh, generalized to certain, certain uh, location. But also the, the research data is, is something interesting. We have an embargoed data, a lot of that, but our principle is that if you share the data with us, we, we are able to share also the exact data, also including the research data. When there is a, like if you go through the process of accepting, like if you are asking for that data, particular data. And of course there's a private data sets that they say that, okay, I don't wanna share it openly, but I'm happy to share it with public authorities for decision makers. And this is something that also creates more of sensitive or the restricted use data than you, you kind of think from, from the beginning. Yes, thanks. Any other questions? Or are there any other questions or remarks in general? So we had like, we had eight talks today. We saw a lot of different initiatives all working towards uh, similar goals in their respective nations. Um, yeah. Any other questions that have come up in between? Well, I, I see some uh, great things here, uh, but again and again, I get disappointed by countries reinventing the wheel. 
uh, by people creating their own solutions. We need to work to global solutions to all of these things. I mean, Carrie was saying about the small amount of rare species are blocking all of use of GBIF for its national solutions. And I don't think that should be the case. Uh, it's great to see the ALA um, doing things and sharing their code with everybody so that other countries can use those atlases. But we need, those are our examples that we should really be heading for and making the most of the small amount of money we have got to solve the biodiversity crisis. Yeah, thank you. Well, if there are no other remarks, then I would like to close. Oh, sorry. sorry. Maybe a, a bit in response to that. Um, it also depends on the funding, right? So my mine is. Uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> so. I'm always asked, like, are you just building something for the Dutch researchers? I think the similar question was to the French uh, infrastructure. Your first answer will be yes, because that's your assignment. Then again, the technology that we're developing and using obviously doesn't care. So indeed, sometimes it may look like a national infrastructure is super focused on its own. But if we build at least the tools that we feel are still missing, and can be shared globally, then we are setting sort of modules of examples. So for instance, for, for the Dutch one, I know there's a GBIF, I know there's a DISCO, I know there's many observational uh, platforms already. And we felt, well, what's missing is for instance, the digital identification. And we definitely hope by building such a repository deployment, uh, even training modules, evaluation modules, that can actually be used by anyone, especially working through Tatwick to set also the data standards. So just, I don't think it's, don't be disappointed just yet. <laughs> I don't think. Uh... <laughs> Fair enough. I do have one question to the crowd, if I may. I think one of the biggest problems that are kind of under the water is where to store the data. And I wonder how other nations have picked this up, because I love GBIF too, but it's a repository for data that has already been stored in a particular way so that it is accessible and everything else. The biggest problem is all of those researchers that just do whatever because there's no great solution or something that's super user friendly. So if you have any ideas, I'd be more than happy to know. Maybe I can answer at least for NFTI for biodiversity. Katya at this in, in the slides uh, saying that there's seven um, partners within uh, NFTI for biodiversity that are have the roles of research data repositories. Um, there is, those are usually uh, already partners that have, um, they all have already connections to GBIF, they all handle their own data and, and have their own expertise. And so when a data set comes in from, from a researcher that is not connected to, to any of those, um, then there's a process to, to see, okay, which um, partner is best suited for that kind of data. So of course we as the BGBM wouldn't be accepting any zoological data, but uh, and then we have one partner that is pretty broad and will like, cover all of the rest, even though it's not in as much detail. So that's how it works for us. So we, the data is stored with the partners who already do it anyway, and who then also deliver the data to GBIF in the name of those researchers. Right, right. Also including raw data, because for instance, for the sound recordings, we're talking terabytes per day. Partially. We, we do some media files, but no, not terabytes per day. Any other um, initiative wants to answer that question? Um, Jutta Buschbaum, I was wondering, so following up on what Quentin said and what Elaine said, um, there are characteristics and tasks that need to be done exclusively at the global level. And I'm wondering who's going to cover these tasks. And I don't think that if the GBIF can do every, everything. I mean, they're just too small. So I'm just wondering who is going to cover the tasks and uh, requirements that are needed to integrate our data globally. Mm. 
maybe that's a plug for the Global Biodiversity Alliance um, program, which I think is trying to sew those kind of big problems together at that global level. But I, I mean, I think I do appreciate that there are some that are harder than others or less mature than others. So for example, the geoscience problems, um, there really, to my mind, isn't a really strong global um, aggregator or solution in that space right now. And for the collections communities like mine, that's hurting because we have exemplars like GBIF for the, for the life science communities, but not for the earth. Uh, and we, certainly I, would look towards aggregating those in a, those problems in a single space if we at all can, but we just can't do that right now. Um, I just wanted to go to the storage problem for very briefly. Um, actually, for us in the UK, that's less of an issue. Usually that's an easy one to solve. In fact, there's normally no shortage of people offering me high performance computing or storage solutions. Um, and actually the private sector is quite keen to support that. It's all the bits that you need to build on top of that, the sort of thing actually that you're doing, that's the really hard bit. S storage, at least for us, even as a sort of a national institution, sometimes we're, we're certainly generating very many terabytes of data a day, but we've got that more or less under control. Um, actually, what we struggle with is providing real-time access to that because of the tiered layers of storage that we tend to use. But generally speaking, at least in the UK, the storage bit isn't so much of a problem, but I suspect it's a patchwork of problems and each country will have its own set of challenges, depending upon the maturity of the different bits of the domain you know, within that within that nation. And that, I guess, links back to that point about needing to think globally to solve those sort of problems. Well, thank you for that uh, remark. So um, with a view on the time, um, Notice there is still a lot of um, uh, will to discuss these things further. Um, so I suggest we move those discussions into Slack and maybe uh, the people who have ra raised the questions here can like quickly put them in the Slack as well. So we can group the, the discussions by topic and not don't have them all in the main channel. So I want to thank all of the speakers today. Uh, there were some really, really impressive presentations today. Uh, thank you so very much. I want to thank um, Anton and Katja for organizing this session in the first place um, and taking care of all of the pre-work. Uh, I want to thank Marcus and Jörg for the assistance here today. Uh, yeah, thanks to all of the people who have asked questions, who kept the conversation going, of course, to all of the audience. And then there's one group I want to uh, thank in particular, because I, I think they haven't deserved, gotten the, the, the um, appreciation they deserve. Our in-room helpers who take care of uh, the presentations with the... Yeah, with with Zoom, with the cameras. Uh, so we couldn't do this uh, here today with you. Um, doing a, a hybrid conference is quite challenging. Uh, with your support, it is possible. And the feeling I got so far, it, it's working quite well, both for the uh, in-person participants and the online participants as well. So thank you so much.